you all can see the incredible diversity of life around us. And we all know that there's so many different forms of living organisms. Looking at it, it's hard to believe that from the scientific point of view, there is really only one life form on Earth. One life form, which means one type of biology. So the biochemistry of living processes is the same in all known life. The blueprint for all cells is the same. And looking at the molecular level, all cells of every organism we ever know living on Earth will have the same strategy for storing genetic information and for growing and for making proteins and metabolism. We don't fully understand how even that one type of cells really works because cells are so complex. They're crowded with proteins, with nucleic acids and with small molecules. And millions of people years have been spent studying biochemistry Yet, we still don't have a complete map of even a single type of life cell. So, if you had something so complex, how would you go about understanding it? Well, one way of doing it is to make it simpler. And that's the whole point of field of synthetic cell engineer engineering. We want to build a simplest living cell from scratch. The guiding principle of our field is a quote from a brilliant physicist. Um, a guy who understood the importance of hands-on approach to solving problems and paraphrasing him. Make it yourself so you know how it's made. Synthetic cells are bringing the principles of engineering into biology. We can make cells with full control of all of its parts, uh, just like engineering mechanical devices. And so in many ways, we can think of a synthetic cell as a biological breadboard or prototyping board. Uh, which is a platform to test different designs and to engineer biological systems as if they're mechanical or electrical. How do we build a synthetic cell? The anatomy of most synthetic cells is fundamentally not that different from all known living cells. They're lipid containers expressing genes into proteins. The cell is surrounded by a lipid membrane and most of the time that membrane is made of some kind of a lipid known from natural cells, the phospholipids and cholesterol. Lipids have a polar hydrophilic head group and non-polar hydrophobic tails. And uh, despite its bad reputation, cholesterol is actually good for membranes uh, because it makes them flexible. The membrane often has channels which are proteins that allow transport of nutrients and signals from the outside and the removal of waste products from the inside of the cell. In synthetic cells, we usually use simple channels that create um, rather non-specific holes in the membrane. One of the most common channels is called alpha hemolysin, which is uh, originally a bacterial toxin. Since the main point of having a membrane is to separate self from the environment, the inside of the synthetic cell uh, from the outside, a synthetic cell can also be made in a droplet, a drop of water surrounded by oil phase. And millions of droplets can be made at the same time in a so-called droplet microfluidic system. In a droplet, you can't use membrane channels, since there's no membrane. but for other applications, the microfluidic systems are widely used to make a lot of, lots of different types of synthetic cells. And regardless of how it's done, the compartment is a relatively simple problem. Uh, the really interesting stuff is what's going on inside the synthetic cell. The genes, uh, the protein expression, and the metabolism. Just like natural life, uh, synthetic cells express proteins from DNA genomes. Those genomes are usually relatively simple, uh, up to a dozen genes at a time. To look at the scale of engineering we're talking about, we can compare genome sizes of natural and artificial cells. So humans have about 20,000 genes, bacteria about order of magnitude less. First, live organism with a completely synthetic genome has 474 genes. And our non-living synthetic minimal cell it usually has about a dozen genes. So as you can see, there's a lot of room for engineering larger synthetic cell genomes. 
and also a lot of technical progress uh, we need to make to get there. To make a complete cell, complete live cell, uh, the genes need to be expressed into proteins. Uh, in synthetic cells, protein expression is done by in vitro translation system. Actually, most of proteins in small molecules in a synthetic cell are employed in translation processes, not unlike what happens in live cells. The in vitro translation system contains uh, ribosomes, tRNA, RNA polymerases to make mRNA, enzymes to load amino acids into tRNA, and small molecules needed for translation. All of those components are purified and then recombined to encapsulate inside a synthetic cell, creating a synthetic cell cytoplasm. The most commonly used in vitro translation system is made from components purified from bacteria. It's possible to use many different source organisms though, all the way up to a human cell-derived protein expression systems. The bacterial system is used because it's the fastest and cheapest one to work with. Other organisms are used when we need to express more complex genes or do some post-translational modifications to proteins. And this is one of the main reasons why synthetic cells can be thought of as jigsaw puzzles, because the protein expression and metabolism can come from any number of different organisms. It builds a hybrid cell that combines properties of different kinds of metabolism. The complete synthetic cell, uh, a membrane surrounding protein expression system, is not alive. It performs some but not all functions of live cells. It's currently a very fast-growing area of research. Although we don't yet have a hard definition of what makes a cell alive, by working with synthetic cells we can begin to learn what confers the properties of live cells, such as the ability to replicate or grow. How can we use synthetic cells? Synthetic cells can have many applications in research and many practical applications relevant to everyday life. For one, understanding natural cells is necessary for building synthetic cells, and it works the other way around too. If we build an understandable synthetic life cell, we'll learn a ton about natural life. Similarly, making cells from scratch requires a lot of progress in research technologies, building new bioengineering tools, while having synthetic living systems will be a tool in and out of itself for biology. Some other specific applications of synthetic cells are making new biomaterials not found in nature, building biocomputers that run on artificial genetic circuits, using synthetic cells to reconstitute primordial cells and studying the origin of life, Synthetic cells are basics for astropharmacy applications and help with search for life elsewhere in the solar system. And synthetic cells are excellent biofactories for making small molecules and protein products and for developing new metabolic engineering circuits. Also, the ability to engineer cells and cell-like systems is very valuable for studying diseases and for making small amounts of drugs, uh, which will be foundation of future personalized medicine. In the second part of this talk, I'll cover different ways to make synthetic cells, applications of this technology, and the international community working on synthetic cell engineering. <laughs>